Hi, my name is Bill Tella. I'm a co-founder and economist at Agoric. And what I wanted to talk to you today to, about today is the history of smart contracts, and in particular, the pre-blockchain history of smart contracts. I think we know a lot about the story of the different efforts to create digital currencies that led up to the creation of Bitcoin, um, as well as the innovations in cryptography and Byzantine fault-tolerant distributed systems that made that possible. But I think the, uh, much less is known about the early history of smart contracts, and I think that's a pity um, because it's an interesting story. Um, I also think that there's uh, maybe some lessons we can still learn from it. Um, and it was a story that I was fortunate to be um, involved with and, with and play a small part in. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk to you this evening. And I really want to cover three things. Um, first is what I call Web Zero, um, which dates back to 1988, roughly through the early 90s, um, which was really an attempt um, pre-web to visualize and build what this interconnected world um, that we find ourselves living in today. Uh, then next, I want to talk about um, the smart, what I'm calling here the smart contract pioneers. Uh, these were moving forward a bit in time to the mid-90s on into the early 2000s. And this was really an effort to figure out what are smart contracts and what technologies we need to, in order to build them. And then finally, just going to conclude with a little bit of what I call the smart contract stack to maybe pull out some of the lessons from that. Uh, so before I dive into that, I just want to say, what is a smart contract? This is the same as what Kate used, so I won't go into it very much. But um, you know, basically, we, we, we mean a contract-like arrangement uh, that's enforceable by code. I think what's different here is, um, or what's special here is it makes it different than some ordinary run-of-the-mill program, is that there's multiple parties with multiple diverse interests involved. Uh, these parties. Um, don't have mutual trust amongst each other. These are often cases where you're exchanging uh, something with somebody, half, some stranger halfway around the world. Uh, so now let me dive into what I mean by Web Zero. How many people here have heard of Web Three? Okay, so Web Three is this idea of uh, moving to a decentralized web. Um, bringing power back to the uh, participants. And um, let me sort of put that in some context is, um, first of all, the Web 1, uh, the technology started emerging in the early 90s for the World Wide Web, um, but really took hold um, about 1995. Um, this one really started to take off. It's probably best uh, illustrated by Netscape's super successful IPO of that year, and really ran up till the uh, dot-com bust in uh, 2001. And this, of course, you know, generated all sorts of crazy excitement, um, not too different in many ways from today. Um, but then in 2001, with the bust and a lot of companies going bankrupt, so there, there were many who thought that, well, this shows that there's not actually much to this web World Wide Web story. And so the Web 2 movement sort of started afterwards, which was saying, no, there's some really useful stuff here. And uh, we are now be able to have build richer uh, web en environments and, and create a more participatory web. Um, this also had their big IPO, which was probably um, best represented by Google's in, in 2004. And, um, super successful, but unfortunately, something went wrong along the way. Um, and this is this, the advertising-driven model combined with network effects has led to this very creepy world we live in of where the business models depend on surveillance economics. Um, hence the need for Web 3. But I want to talk about Web 0. So what do I mean by Web 0? So I want to dive back in to uh, tell a very personal story, which was my summer vacation in 1989. Um, in 1989, I was a 
graduate student economics out in Virginia. I had stumbled across some work by some computer people out here who were applying the economics I was studying to computer systems. I found that fascinating, showed it to my professor, and before I knew it, I was on a plane out to San Francisco to meet with these people. It was a remarkable experience. It was one of those rare moments in my life where I really felt like somebody had pulled back the curtain that separates the present from the future and gave me a glimpse of things to come. Um, that doesn't happen very often. Um, but I realized that for many of you, you weren't even born back then. Um, so I need a little bit to paint the picture of what that uh, was like beforehand. And before I do that, I'll just say what the, the people who came to visit, we called the Xanadu, the Xanamix community. And it was really centered down around two startup companies down in Palo Alto. Uh, one was the Xanadu uh, operating company, and the other was Amex, the American Information Exchange. Um, both were funded back then by Autodesk, and they shared a common parking lot and a vision for a decentralized, interconnected future. Um, but when I went out there, I mean, it, this was just an extraordinary group of people. It consisted of entrepreneurs, programmers, cryptographers, visionaries. But the world I was coming from was very different. Um, this was in 1989, so we're definitely talking pre-blockchain. We were also pre-web, and in many ways, we were pre-internet. Um, the internet protocols existed, but commercialization didn't occur until um, 1993. And of course, the computers we were using were much less powerful. This was 30 years of more law in reverse. Um, I think the computer I had at the time was a uh, PC, probably a 286 running DOS. Uh, Mac had come out in 1984, but they weren't widely available or weren't widely distributed, so my computer still had no mouse because I had no windows that I needed to click on to close. Um, and also, communication was much more restricted. Um, if you had communication at all, it was through a 1200 baud dial-up modem. And for many of you, probably you don't have no sense of what that is, especially if you're um, used to today's connectivity. So I was trying to think of how do I illustrate that for, the, for those who are used to today's world. And I think you can kind of sort of think of it as a difference between whether you're walking from San Francisco to LA or if you're um, taking a flight. Um, it was very, very slow and painful. Um, so this was the world where I came out to visit in these the Zanzamix community in Palo Alto. So what do I mean by Web Zero? What did I see there? Well, I saw many fascinating things that I won't be able to touch on a few of them. Um, but I really want to highlight five of them that I think are relevant to the story of smart contracts. Uh, first, there was Xanadu was trying to build the global docuverse, um, which was really a worldwide web of hyperlinked documents. This was, of course, the web before there was a web. Then there was Goric Open Systems, the um, two of the lead architects at, at, um, at Xanadu had been involved in really thinking about distributed computational markets and incentive engineering. Uh, there were I idea futures markets, um, which we now know as prediction markets. There was Amex, the other startup company that was building peer-to-peer -peer exchange driven by smart contracts. And there was Habitat, which was the world's first virtual world. So I'll start with Xanadu. Xanadu was trying to realize Ted Nelson's vision of hypertext, as I said, the, the docuverse. Ted Nelson was the person who coined the term hypertext. The Xanadu operating company was formed actually to build the technology to realize that dream. You know, of course, a lot of that has been, of their dream was eventually realized with the World Wide Web. Um, but I do think there was aspects of what they were trying to build that were very different from what the web has emerged. Um, one in particular was they had a very different economic model. So they didn't think of in terms of advertising supported, but in terms of uh, micropayments and royalties to the publishers. 
And they were very much concerned with how hypertext could be used to support social discourse and how that might lead to a more open society. Um, and this is perhaps an area that the current web has not been doing such a great job at. And then there was Agoric Open Systems. As I was saying, um, Mark Miller and Dean Tribble were two of the uh, chief architects at Xanadu. They had been together previously at Xerox Park, where they were working at distributed uh, secure programming languages. Um, Mark, while he was also at Xerox Park, collaborated with Eric Drexler on something they called Agoric Open Systems. This was a vision of creating computational markets. And they wrote a series of paper, the Agoric System papers, that sort of outlined this view. It was, um, these are the articles that, that I had found that uh, led to my trip out there. Um, but there was more. There was Robin Hansen doing Idea Futures Markets. I was privileged to witness one of the uh, first uh, prediction markets in existence, which was being done on a whiteboard in the Xanadu um, offices. They were um, debating the issue of whether cold fusion, which was a big thing in the news back then, was really real. Uh, Robin went on after that to uh, get a PhD in economics from Caltech and really develop these ideas further. Um, and Caltech was a big uh, center of experimental economics and the experimental economics community had been very early involved in this. There was a group around Vernon Smith at the University of Arizona who came up with the idea of smart computer assisted markets and developed things like uh, combinatorial auctions that were you know, now possible on computers. Probably most relevant for the story I want to tell today is Amex, the American Information Exchange. Um, I got to meet um, Phil Salen, who was the entrepreneur behind it. Um, and he, Phil was a very uh, amazing person who was really one of the first people to realize that software, computers, and communication could be used to radically reduce transaction costs. And if you radically reduce transaction costs, then you can increase the number of exchange and, and cooperation among people across, spread out across the globe. Amex was, has a strong claim to being the first smart contracting platform. Now, this was very early days. Now, remember the picture I was painting. This was, you know, DOS interfaces, and it was run on a centralized computer. But their model was very much peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And it was very different than what was out there um, at that time, which was these dial-up systems like CompuServe and Prodigy, um, which were very much following sort of a, a broadcast or a, or a magazine-type model where you would log on, and then they would be, provide you the information, and you would just be a passive consumer. On Amex was designed for people to exchange with each other, whether that's digital goods or offline goods or actually services, um, what they called mini consulting. And behind that was a smart contracting platform. It wasn't called that back then, but it was actually a uh, system that was built to actually support, but not just the execution of the contract, but also negotiation. They had built-in dispute resol resolution. Um, so this is very, you know, very advanced for its time. Now, obviously, this is you know, centralized system, a long way from blockchain um, where we are today. But I think a lot of the pieces of what we see today were already in place back then. In addition, there's. Um, I also saw my first virtual world on this trip. There was a uh, Lucasfilm's Habitat. Uh, the two sort of lead engineers of the uh, uh, of, of Amex were Chip Morningstar and Randy Farmer, and they had previously built uh, Lucasfilm Habitat for Lucasfilms and Quantum Link. Quantum Link was the early iteration of what would become AOL. And among many things they invented were things like avatars and sort of the and what they discovered was really the importance of virtual property and how exchange and, and uh, 
money and stuff like that quickly evolved um, in these virtual worlds. So it's a fascinating social experiment. And so what you saw was that you had the, all these various systems and ideas and, and, and technologies running together there. And even though the technology itself was very primitive, I think the ideas um, share much in common with what we think of today with the decentralized web or web three. So as we sort of move forward into the 90s, you know, after my trip, the uh, Xanamix community sort of expanded and inter intermingled with other groups such as the cypherpunks and the Estropians and stuff like this, and more and more people became interested in these ideas. Um, new companies were formed to realize these ideas. Um, one was a precursor of ours called Agorix. And another one was Electric Communities, which was where Randy Farmer and uh, Chip Morningstar and Mark Miller ended up trying to build out a, a much a decentralized version of Habitat. And as part of this, I came up with these, uh, what they called the eight um, requirements for cyberspace protocol. And I think if we look at this, they're, you know, they're very much what we're looking for today. You know, it needs to be scalable, it needs to be open, needs to be decentralized, needs to be traversable, needs to be commercial, social, secure, portable. So this was, you know, again, 1994. So a lot of what we're really looking for in a decentralized web were very much in the air back then. But of course, didn't really have all the means to, to implement this. So moving forward a little bit, you really had one, I think of as the smart contract pioneers. Um, so this is starting in the mid 90s, leading up to like the 2000s. And you have had Nick Zabo who coined the term smart contracts. You had Ian Grigg who came up with the notion of Ricardian contracts. And you had Mark Miller who emphasized e-rights and developed the e-programming language which was designed specifically for building these distributed open systems and uh, smart contracting platforms. I think it's important to emphasize that, that these different pioneers were really very much in contact with each other um, through various online email lists. They met up at various conferences. They were well aware of each other's work. Um, if you read their papers and writings from the time, they all cite each other. So this is very much a community building on these ideas. And for all of them, I think smart, they were seeing smart contracts as a piece of the larger system of how we create these open decentralized worlds. One of uh, Nick's earliest papers on uh, smart contracts, where he talks about smart contracts as building blocks of digital markets sort of lays out different design criteria that we may look for in, in smart contract systems. So there's observability, do the parties to the contract, are they able to observe what the other parties are doing? Is it verifiable if you need to go to an arbitrator, can they see what happened or, or didn't? Is it enforceable? In this case, does the code itself enforce it? And then there was something he calls privity. Um, privity is a sort of old common law term related to contracts where the, just the parties involved in the contract and the arbitrators are the only ones who really need to know um, the details of the contract and be involved in enforcing the performance of the contract. And I think privity is a very important um, point that, to be raised, especially this early in thinking about this, because it really gets not just to the confidentiality surrounding contracts, but also um, the integrity of execution, and it shows that there's much more than just the enforcement of the terms itself. It's, it's, it's how visible these are to others that, that matter. Then there's Ian Grigg, who um, was developing a system called Ricardo. Um, I think it was like 1995, 1996, um, which was really trying to do financial instruments. Um, creating things like bonds. 
And um, it was in this context that he developed the idea of Ricardian contracts, uh, where basically they were, you know, having 50 different rights bundled in a bond in, in the contract, and how do you represent that in code? And the solution he came up with is, is you can cryptographically connect the written contract to the, to the code, so as the code executes, if there becomes an issue related to what rights are involved, you always have the written contract to refer to. Um, but again, this is very much just part of a bigger system and one of the issues that we're really wrestling with back then is what, what is the technology stack? How do we, you know, what are the pieces we need in order to build the um, smart contracts that can play this role in this broader, um, broader open decentralized world? So he had this notion of, uh, or this paper he wrote called Financial Cryptography in Seven Layers, where he sort of lays out, uh, you know, one, one hierarchy of this. Um, similarly, Mark Miller, who you know was background was programming languages, had worked at Agorix building uh, decentralized computational markets. He worked at Electric Communities, helping to build the programming language to support these decentralized open virtual worlds. And he came at it very much from a programming language perspective, but still was focused on how what are the what are the layers that we need to build up in order to get to the place we want to get to with smart contracts? So his first layer down here is distributed object capabilities, which provides um, secure programming. And out of that, we can build electronic rights. And from that, get to contracts and then networks of contracts, et cetera. Now, the thing sort of lurking in the background all this time related to smart contracts was something called the cypherpunk dilemma, which is I can, can't trust code that runs on your computer and you can't trust code that runs on mine, right? So if I control the computer, I essentially could control the, what the code does. So how can we have smart contracts? Well, the solution that sort of everybody jumped to was sort of, well, you can run it code on a mutually trusted machine as long as there's somebody else that we both trust then we're happy to run our code on that and then we get a nice smart contract. Um, but as Nick Zabo pointed out, third parties can be security holes. So there's a better solution and this is what really brings us to today and that's you can run the code on the blockchain. And I think a big part of what the blockchain revolution is from the perspective of the early smart contract things is it gives you a much more credible computer that you have a, instead of running your code on somebody else's computer or running it on a third party, you actually run it across many computers and if they all agree, well then we have confidence that that is a, is a correct result from that computation. So if you sort of bring all this together, Something I want to call the smart contract stack. Some of the lessons I think um, that these early smart contract pioneers were groping towards. And this notion of credibility comes from economics. There's this concept of credible commitments, which is, okay, I want to transact with somebody. This is transaction is spread out over time and or space. Then how do I know that they will keep their commitments. You know, what can they do that's credible to me that they will hold, you know, keep their commitments that they agree to? So this really permeates the whole stack. So at the lowest level, we have credible computers. Again, the blockchain gets us further down that road than we've ever been before. I don't think it gets us anywhere near perfection, but it gives us a much better credible computing base to build upon. Um, but then you need credible code, a lot of effort, um, especially by Mark with the building secure programming language has been to, you know, how do we actually build the foundations and programming languages and virtual machines that then we can build up a secure base for creating programs that are credible when they run. Um, again, formal, today we also see formal methods um, bringing in other tools to that, to um, getting credible code. And then there's this notion of protected, I'm calling protected property. And this, I think, harks back to the uh, 
virtual property that was being created in virtual worlds. And that was one of the earliest realization that there's this notion in, in computers that is very much like property in the real world. Uh, there was there's a law professor, Joshua what's it, Fairfield, who, who thank you, who um, wrote this paper in 2005 called Virtual Property, and he lists sort of three criteria need for having property in computer systems that, that act like property in the real world. And um, one is rivalrousness, which just basically means that, you know, if you have it, I can't. Um, persistence, right? You don't want your object to disappear when you turn off your computer. Um, and interconnectedness, that we can, all, you know, multiple people can interact with this, so we need to have some, some, some ability to exclude or, or transfer and all the other things that go along with that. And it's really building in this layer that I think is a very important when we think about building a smart contract stack. We need, we need virtual property, we need to reify rights within the software. Um, these need to persist. I mean, another thing that blockchains have give us, given us is a history that persists so we know who has ownership of what. And on top of that, we can then start talking about credible commitments between people and how smart contracts enable that. Thanks. That was really trying to be a real quick uh, tour through 30 years of history, but um, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you about the history. Thank you about the history part. It's the most important that what people realize. But do you think it's kind of like an idealistic idea what you're saying? You're hoping for all for uh uh web three when we don't know who can develop, you know, who develop foundation, this is the people who make the rules, you know. So in this case, uh, we know it was developed like a government program, you know, so it's implied by uh, people from engineers and everything they designed it on government one, right? And this is why we still sued it, you know, so we wanted to create like what you say, open, unrestricted, whatever, so if we individually not gonna have together with money and build this infrastructure to begin with, it's never gonna be open, it's never gonna be what we want. So, whoever invested in the infrastructure, they're going to make the rules, and this is what is going to enforce them. Whatever you do, this financial system exists now because it's getting enforced, right? So, you created, you could want to create something which is unenforceable in the sense of unenforceable, how we can be, how we can be given by individuals. So, if we're not the one who are going to create the system, we're never going to have the system. And I assume it correctly, I'm not an IT guy, I'm just trying to do some math because I've been looking on those financial systems somehow, but I'm still, I'm still don't believe in what what happened, you know? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I do think it's idealistic. I don't think that's necessarily bad. Um, but, but I do think that it's, it's, there's a lot more potential now for it happening than I've seen before. And partly, I think there, there are a lot of people with a lot of funding out building these systems to try to enable this, people like Protocol Labs and, and others. And, you know, so, so we're beginning to see the pieces get into place. And I think a large part of that has to do with the, um, you know, the economic model that had grown up around in the Web2 world, which was advertising driven. So if we can get these other pieces in place, which allow people to get revenue, you know, get rewarded for their efforts and other, other, through other means, then that gives us a lot better chance to realize this decentralized web. So yes, it could be captured by others and that sort of thing. But I do think we have a better chance. There's a lot of people working on it. Um, so we may actually get there for, certainly hope we do. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I recall there's like some part of that where it talks about like the need for like standards and protocols. And that's worked well for like web one and two, um, where everyone conforms to like TCP IP and that sort of thing. Now like you have this new kind of way of this where like everyone creates their own like new protocol for like anything really. Do you see that as like good or bad or like 
just okay, we're gonna convert them all before we get the K in one thing. Yeah, I guess for us, I, I do think we eventually will get to um, inner blockchain protocols and actually you can, can raise up the layer of a, levels of abstraction to get to a point where we can have, um, you know, not necessarily the need to build separate protocols at every stage. You know, part of that I think is a, a learning lesson. I do think it's good we have experimentation. So as we as we do get new protocols that sort of standardize, that they need to enable, you know, many flowers to bloom. Um, so I do think that's something, you know, more a sign of immaturity of the industry rather than sort of what it will end up in perhaps. So. So obviously going back to the days, you have a really unique perspective on all of the peaks and valleys and all the starts and stops and sputters. And you mentioned capital being something that uh, is made, made unique to this era, that there's, there's really well-funded groups out there um, that can support uh, the research that we see. So I'm just curious from your perspective, having the context that you do, what are you most optimistic about, what you're most excited about today versus when you were first exposed to this uh, 30 years ago? Um, well, the interesting thing, of course, to me is that, you know, now the whole world's talking about this rather than just a small group. I think at one point, I felt if we had a car crash on 101, it would have, you know, knocked out the majority of us. Um, so that's, that's certainly exciting. And, and the fact that this is truly global, it just astonishes me. You know, back in the, you know, the web one revolution, you know, the, 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 the dot-com boom and bust, it wasn't global yet, right? The internet was new. It wasn't, everybody wasn't connected. So the fact that this is happening everywhere, you know, and that there's, there is this experimentation. So I think that it's not just that there's capital flowing in here, but it's the barriers to entry are very low. You know, open source, open source was a huge battle, right? We didn't have open source in 1989. There was free software, but it wasn't used in commercial things. And one of the big problem with a lot of these earlier, early systems is, you know, they were trying to build very difficult, you know, new things. And, you know, the, the businesses that they were in weren't always commercially successful and they would, you know, die. But unfortunately, the software would die with them. It would get stuck. So open source was a battle to free that up so you could keep building on it. So I think open source was the first revolution. And now we're sort of getting into another revolution of open protocols and trying to figure out how can we create a sustainable economic model around that. And I think there's a lot of questions unanswered, you know, and, and you know, but I think that there's a lot of excitement and brain power and people over the world trying to figure this out. So I'm very optimistic about that. Yeah. 